The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of this station, JVC Broadcasting Management, or its sponsors. Welcome to Crime and Justice Radio, where we talk all things crime, justice, mayhem, and the courts with expert insiders and legal outcasts. I'm Aida Leisenring, and I'm here with Bruce Barquette. How are you doing, Bruce? Good evening. How are you? I'm well. How was your weekend? Um, my weekend was fine. You know, every time I hear that announcement at the beginning of our show that the uh, views are not necessarily those of the station, I think of God rest his soul, Rush, and the, the phrase, but they should be, come to my mind. And I think, oh my God, I am so grateful for that disclaimer, because one of these days, my true views might slip out. <laughs> we'll say something truly outrageous. But speaking of... Um, uh, crazy views, you know, to mask or not to mask. I had uh, a weekend that I'll, it, it felt like I was in a hot tub time machine and I went back to 2019. I went to a Starbucks inside of a Target. No one was masked. I went to a nightclub, which is, by the way, like hot tub time machine. Hot two, tub? Time 2010 machine? for me or 2001. Um, at rooftop, everyone was out in Manhattan. People weren't wearing masks. It's as if nothing had happened. Ah, and which brings us to, in some ways, our first guest, because people are back at bars. People are back at uh, restaurants. People are again celebrating together and drinking. Uh, And we have a holiday weekend coming up. And we have uh, with us Steve Epstein, who is the Epstein of Barquette Epstein, not Jeffrey Epstein, or otherwise related to him. Oh, um, by the way, the guards. <laughs> you had to go there. The guard, the guards. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> uh, hey, Steve. The, the guards just pled guilty, who were supposedly watching him that night, pled guilty to uh, falsifying documents. Uh, so that little chapter is over, and but, we'll never see a public trial and, about it. And we're going to move on to the Stephen Epstein, who I brag about. I don't brag about a lot of people that I'm related to professionally, or or, um, you know, by family, because I feel like I'm biased. Um, But I can say safely, I'm not biased. You are the number one guy, in my view, uh, on DWIs and vehicular crimes. And that's why you're instrumental uh, the week before Memorial Day, because if we had you on at six o'clock on Memorial Day, it might be too late for folks who are listening. Um, so obviously, we're, we're going to tell our, our, all our listeners not to drink and drive, but welcome to our show, Steve, and you come in when they do. <laughs> Thank you, Aida. Thank you, Bruce, for having me. It's great to be here. And uh, following up on what you just said, I was at Madison Square Garden yesterday, and 15,000 people there rooting loudly for the New York Knicks, and it was like... Uh, like super spreading? Like, uh, every, everything, was, <laughs> everything was back to normal. Really was. There was a tiny little section of uh, people that weren't vaccinated had to socially distance, and it was it was like one section of people. And they were the thrilled that packed, they didn't have to be together. consolidated like sardines. <laughs> packed together. So, yeah. Uh, and those people were drinking, drinking alcohol. So, uh, so, yeah, so be out there, right? So, Steve, f- first a couple of things about your introduction. You truly are the guy when it comes to DWI, vehicular crimes, I would say certainly in New York, certainly in the metropolitan area, certainly in the state of New York, and I would argue even in the country. You teach other lawyers. New York City Legal Aid Society every year allows you to put on a program to train all of their lawyers on how to handle these cases. You teach at Harvard. You teach at Harvard. You've taught at Berkeley, and you've gone to Vegas. You've toured around the country lecturing other lawyers, and you established an institute, and you've gotten lawyers in the metropolitan area to pay you money over the course of a year so you could teach them how to handle uh, DWI cases. So it, 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 when Aida says he's the best, he really is the best. And he's got an intoxilizer machine in his office. He does. <laughs> I've been very fortunate to find something. I always tell my children, find something in your career that you're you're really good at, that, that you can make money at. I'm really good at eating Oreo cookies, but nobody pays me to do it. I was very fortunate to find something that uh, I can be very good at, that... Um, and, and I enjoy it. I enjoy teaching it. So yeah, thank me for thank you for having me on here to talk to other people about it as well. And I I think you hit the nail right on the head at the beginning, which is don't drink and drive, right? But and once you've made that decision and you're in that position, um, there's some decisions you have to make that are kind of critical. And 
that there are some some important decisions obviously you have to make when you're in that position. Well, it's not that you can't drink and drive. It's you can't drink to excess right. and drive, right? I can have a glass of wine well, with I dinner. Guess. I can even have two glasses of wine with dinner. I just can't drink to the point where my BAC blood alcohol content rises yeah. above the legal limit. What is what is the I, legal I, limit I, and what is blood alcohol content? I, well, I guess that's going to depend on whether the legislature has their way, right? There's a bill that's currently pending before the New York State Legislature, which would basically tell you not to drink and drive. So there's two different ways that DWI could be prosecuted. Uh, one is what we call per se DWI, which creates an absolute threshold that you can't drive while you have a blood alcohol concentration of 0.08. But, Bruce, the problem that po- most people that people have to realize is they don't take your generally take your blood when they arrest you for DWI, uh, unless there's some really serious accident. What they do instead is they take a breath test, and it's an indirect measurement. It's an indirect measurement that relies on a lot of uh, presumptions. It's like a one-size-fits-all indirect measurement. Uh, We don't have to kind of get into the specifics of Henry's Law and the blood-to-breath partition ratio, but the bottom line is that I've never fit into it. Thank you for not getting into that. (laughs) You know? (laughs) <laughs> and what happens is it, the measurement is just not accurate. So you're relying upon their uh, their conversion, and so you're, you're really trusting it. That .08 doesn't necessarily mean that you are intoxicated the way you believe intoxication to mean. It just means that that's your blood alcohol concentration, and it's measured by a breath test. The other way they could prosecute you is by proving that your physical and mental abilities to operate a motor vehicle is substantially impaired, and that's what we call common law DWI. And that's usually how they charge you if you haven't taken the breath test. That is, if you refuse to submit to a breath test or you don't give them that evidence. And and that, by the way, because a lot of people ask me, you know, (laughs) that sounds awful. A lot of people ask me whether or not they should blow or not blow when they're stopped by police as if I know a lot of people that are drinking or driving. Um, But but the license revocation attached to that refusal to submit to the portable breath test can be one year. Isn't that right? Right. So the first, right, the first thing is no, not as to the portable breath test. When you're in the field and they ask you whether you, they want you to blow into the portable breath test that's in the field, there's no license revocation that's attest, attached to that one. That's just simply going to be used to determine probable cause whether to bring you into the station. You can't have your license revoked for refusing to blow into that. Um, it's the one that they bring you back to the station and have you blow into that's an evidentiary breath test. If you refuse to blow into that one, they have to give you your refusal warnings first and tell you that if you refuse to submit to this test or any portion thereof, then evidence of this refusal could be admitted against you and your license to operate a motor vehicle could be revoked for one year. Under those circumstances, then yes, your license can be revoked for a period of one year. And it could be more than that. If you have two uh, prior alcohol-related offenses or refusals in your past, that actually could result in a lifetime revocation. So it's something to take very seriously. And for people who really need their driver's license to get to and from work, if it's the most critical thing, it's a really, really important decision. And the most important thing I could tell people is you do have, in that situation, what I call a limited right to counsel. Limited because there's there's really two fundamental rights to counsel. There's the Fifth Amendment and Sixth Amendment right whoa, to counsel. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> You're losing us all in the weeds here of, of, yeah. of, of this. Ahead. Stop for a second. A uh, buddy of mine's driving back from a barbecue, had a few beers over the course of the afternoon, maybe had a glass, you know, gin and tonic. He gets pulled over. They ask him to do a few field sobriety tests. He does them, and they say, we want you to take the test at the station house. Does he take it? Yep. Should he take it or shouldn't he? He, call, he says, I want to call my buddy Bruce. That's the first thing he does. And the reason he does that is because he has a limited right to counsel, and he should assert it under every possible scenario. That gives them some some time to, uh, first of all, for the alcohol to be eliminated, because most people will not drink and then immediately get into their car. So alcohol has been absorbed and then is going through the elimination phase. Uh, and that gives them the opportunity to talk to you and get your advice on what to do. Uh, everybody in that. Okay, he calls me, yeah. but I'm at my own barbecue drinking beers. Does he, and not driving home, does he take the test or not? Now he's got to make a decision. So here's the most important thing I could say. There's a myth out there that's wrong. 
which is that everybody should refuse, right? So that's the first thing is don't just think you should refuse because some, you know, because that's the sort of myth out there. First, and this is kind of silly to think of it this way. If you're innocent, right? If you're sober, if you've had like one drink and you think that the blood alcohol concentration is going to come under the legal limit, take the test, of course. If you don't take the test, you're going to lose your license. And if you take the test, you're going to get released from the scene. I mean, that's the obvious thing that most people don't think about. Now, on the other hand, you're extremely intoxicated and the blood alcohol concentration is going to come in way over the legal limit, right? This, this is, uh, you know, a, a certain factor in deciding whether or not you're going to take the test. I mean, look, clearly, if there was a serious car accident and somebody was injured uh, or you've previously been arrested and charged with a DWI, it's another factor that you have to take into consideration in whether or not you take the test. But whether or not you take the test, I can't tell you, like, just generically, Always take the test or always don't take the test. You know, what I can tell you is if you believe that you're sober, definitely take the test. If you believe that you're severely intoxicated and all you're doing is giving evidence to the government of your blood alcohol concentration, realize that if you don't take the test, what the consequence is going to mean. All right. And then you have to make the decision yourself. Oh, a one year not, license revocation. Yeah, wh- exactly. Whether or not. Right. Exactly. So, because in order for you to get back on the road, the only way for you to get back on the road is going to be if you plead guilty to your DWI case so that you can get a conditional license and start driving again. And remember, if you have a prior DWI conviction, now it could be a felony if that's within the last 10 years. So, you know, these are things you have to take into consideration. I, I, There's no black and white. I, I'm I, hearing call Uber, call I, Lyft. I, call Uber. <laughs> and Steve, thanks thanks so much for coming on. We, we very much appreciate it. We'll have you back again, maybe to do an entire hour, a little CLE on all the intricacies and, of this. And marijuana. And marijuana. And, and driving marijuana. laws. Call free number of uh, 877-DWI test in case people are out there and need to make that decision on the road. Okay. And, uh, It was fun talking to you guys. Thanks. Great talking to you, Steve. Take a moment now to um, thank not only Steve, but our entire law firm, Barquette, Epstein, Kieran, Aldea, and Laturco, for sponsoring our show. Uh, We handle all sorts of litigation across the country, and particularly in the metropolitan area. Literally everything from your routine, if there is such a thing, DWI, to the most complex federal Uh, white collar or racketeering cases and as well as civil litigation and you can find us at www.barquetteepstein.com or call us at 516-745-1500 we have offices in suffolk new york city and garden city that brings us from an interesting start to the show with Steve and leading up to the holiday weekend where there's going to be probably a lot of beer and whatnot consumed to a, a more sober, if I can use that word here, topic, which is Quentin Jones. Quentin Jones. And we're actually going to um, also, after we talk about Quentin Jones and tell you what happened in his case, we covered it last week on Crime and Justice Radio, we're going to have one of the most amazing a news correspondent in America, Erin Moriarty. We are so lucky to have her with us. So we're going to ask her her opinion on on Quentin Jones. But last week we reported that his execution was imminent. And indeed, on Wednesday of last week, he was in fact executed against the wishes of his family, which happened to be the victim's family members as well. And nearly 200,000 supporters that were advocating for him. Um, why it's newsworthy now, not just because another human being was executed, was because the media was denied access. That, that, I want to get to that, and we definitely want to talk about that. But I want to dial back just a bit to, to highlight what the state of Texas did. The victim's family, his great aunt, who he had murdered and admitted to it and, and uh, spent his life trying to redeem himself from that event, Uh, begged the state of Texas not to kill Quentin, saying that we've already lost one family member. We do not want to lose another. We do not want to be put through the trauma of another death, needless death of our family member. Please do not execute Quentin. And they did it anyway. And they did it, as you said, privately, without any witnesses whatsoever. The one friend he had, 
the uh, woman who had written in the New York Times and had been corresponding him for years went there to, to be by his side, and they wouldn't let her in because she was a, a quote-unquote press person. And, and here's why it matters. Uh, the Eighth Amendment analysis requires, with respect to whether or not executions are cruel and unusual punishment that violate the Eighth Amendment, uh, that analysis requires court to consider the evolving standards of decency to determine if a particular punishment constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. Here, it's the lethal injection. And when considering those standards of decency, courts look for objective factors to show a change in community standards and knowing whether the inmate suffered is relevant to that inquiry. And think about why press in particular is critical here. Um, our country just executed uh, during the Trump administration 13 inmates to death in the last months of Trump's administration. And the uh, government officials involved with the execution that were there described the process of dying by lethal injection to falling asleep. They called the gurneys beds and the final breaths snores. But those peaceful accounts were starkly at odds with what media witness reports of how prisoners' stomachs rolled, shook, and shuddered as the pentobarbital took effect inside of the U.S. penitentiary. And in Quinton Jones's case, because there were no witnesses, um, executioners reported he took four to five breaths, followed by a deep snore, and he was dead in 10 minutes. You doubt the state's account of how they executed this man. Whether or not I doubt it isn't what's, what matters. What matters is that people have faith and, and, and trust the government, right? And one of the ways we do that is by having complete transparency and everything about the death penalty happens in the dark. There are pharmaceutical companies in America that refuse to make the drugs because they're afraid of their reputations being marred by such a drug. There are doctors, most doctors won't um, administer the lethal injections. So what the government does is they pay people in cash, so there's no paper trail, to execute no inmates. No way, no yeah, way. Yes. And I, I, the, literally cash, literally like, like bags of cash, like, like hundreds and hundreds of hundred dollar bills rolled up 22,000 here. They're experts they hired. They could only find two experts to say that lethal injection wasn't cruel. We're also paid in cash through a different contractor so that there wasn't a paper trail. Pharmacies are guarded. The names of the pharmacies that are providing the drugs are guarded so that there's no accountability or. Uh, loss of business, frankly, because your reputation would be marred if if people knew yeah. that you were creating these kind of drugs, because it is a small percentage of the population these days that actually believes in the death penalty. And, you know, they, the public execution, not public execution, but the public witnessing of executions is as critical as a public trial. You can't have a justice system that it's held where the proceedings are in the dark or behind closed doors, because then only the government knows what took place. And in the case of an execution, there aren't any witnesses afterwards that come out and say, well, let me tell you what happened during this closed trial. Literally, the only person that can tell you is dead. Uh, and you have to have um, public viewing of this, some ob independent right. observers. And it's, I understand that that's Texas law. Right. It's actually uh, a violation, not that it matters to violate this because there's zero remedy, but it's a violation of Texas law section 152.51 of its administrative code. You mean if code. They, they break that code, they, they right. got, Quentin doesn't get resurrected, he doesn't come back to life? Exactly. And, and the other reason the media presence is critical is you want to know accurately what were the last words, who was in attendance? How long until the prisoner was pronounced dead? Did anything go wrong? Was there any suffering? What are the legal issues? What are the humanitarian issues? And, and we know the answers to those questions in some cases are horrific. We heard from uh, an individual who performed executions a few weeks ago, Ron McAndrew, who told us about how they deliberately tried to conceal the horror of the executions. He, right, and he executed people both electric using the electric chair and using lethal injection and in his view and i kind of take his view <laughs> seriously because he was in the room he got to know the inmate um his view was both are equally cruel 
and they're absolutely painful right. for the inmate. And that's what autopsy reports show. Right. They've, they have studies and they have individuals that the anesthesia, anesthetic that they administer initially does not always take hold quick enough to stop the person from feeling the pain. And the drug that kills them uh, mimics drowning. It fills the individual's lungs with foam causing them to suffocate. You can imagine the pain and terror that you'd feel if you're not fully anesthetized. And, and you know, Bruce, I don't mind differing opinions on this subject, and I don't mind a debate. And if uh, doctors or people that had studied this said it wasn't painful, I'd like to hear about it. But the whole point is, let's have transparency. Let's have complete transparency so that we can all make informed decisions about what our views are. We, we can't have the facts just coming from the individuals who are in favor of the death penalty who are uh, performing the executions. We have a right as a free society to understand and to know what's actually taking place. So we need correspondents like our guest coming right up after the break, Erin Moriarty from CBS News. So excited to have her. Can't wait. Welcome back to Crime and Justice Radio. I'm Aida Lysenring. I'm here with Bruce Barquette, and we have an incredible guest. She's one of the coolest women in news, Erin Moriarty, and I'll let Bruce do the honors. Not, not only one of the coolest women in news, an award-winning correspondent with 48 Hours on CBS uh, News. She's a nine-time National Enemy, e- Emmy Award winner, a recipient of the 2001 Overseas Press Club Award, two-time winner of the Association of Women in Radio and Television Gracie Allen Award, top 100 from Irish Magazine honoree, recipient of the Outstanding Consumer Media Service Award presented by the Consumer Federation of America. And, and wait for it. I love this. I didn't know this about you, Aaron. Recipient of the Crime Hottie Award presented by True Crime Uncensored. <laughs> Tell us about that. That's what we want to hear. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll skip that one. I was going to say, yeah, but not always are you happy with me, Bruce. Because while often attorneys and journalists who cover legal issues are on the same page, you know, we look at things differently at times. Well, we both have constitutional obligations, right? We both are fulfilling a constitutional obligation. Um, mandate, if you will. We have uh, we're providing the right to counsel, and you are providing First Amendment. First Amendment. So we, we are kind of brethren or sisters in um, the Constitution, administering it. Right, and we both want the system to work properly, but you often are an advocate, um, and we try not to be. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully most often an advocate. <laughs> <laughs> Almost every day. That's the- yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, you know, so it's it. Sometimes you know we're on the exact same side, and sometimes it feels like you know we're not opposed. We're never opposed, but we might have conflict. Well, you, you, you will sometimes want an interview I've done when I don't want to hand it over. Oh, that's right. Yes. No, we had to go to court <laughs> to get one of those uh, in one oh, of our yes, cases, and, yes, and you actually yes. did cover one of our. Homicide uh, trials two. twice. No, two cases. Oh, and Marty Tancliffe. Marty Tancliffe and That's Cal right. Harris. And Cal Harris. But we have a we have a little role reversal tonight in our in our uh, <laughs> roles because we get to ask you some questions. Uh, and we want to. St- I want to start off with with Quentin Jones. Um, you're familiar with the case, I'm sure. He was executed last week by the state of Texas, and he was executed in secret. No press was permitted in, despite a Texas law that mandates that and we want to get your reaction to what happened to quentin and what texas did well for some reason i think this case has troubled me even more than some of the other executions um because quentin had actually gone public begging for his life um there were you know his his entire family and his victim family because he was related to his victim wanted to uh, see him get clemency and not be put to death. And I saw a video maybe, oh, less than a week before he was executed, um, where he's very well-spoken, and it's heartbreaking. Um, Now, of course, uh, Texas says that, oh, it was a mistake. 
Uh, they had not had an execution for 10 months, um, and they forgot to notify the associate, Associated Press and the local newspaper, the Huntsville item. Um, but that's really difficult to believe. That doesn't um, pass the straight it, face test, does it? I mean, you forgot. It that- and it's important because, and I think this is part of the problem. I mean, the reason why you want the press there, and it's, and it's difficult. Number one is society has to be comfortable with what we do and executing somebody and, and having to hear about it and in some cases witness it, um, it is important. If you're going to have a system where society decides who they actually execute. Um, but also, if, if something goes wrong, and we know that there are botched executions, and now we don't know what happened to Put Jones. We have to just take the word for the state. The same state that botched the procedure by excluding the press. Exactly. And so, no, it's very disturbing. And, I, I mean, I would recommend people to go online and see him. I think you have to. I think you have to face the humanity um, and the idea that he's just not with us anymore. And as I know all too well, I've been uh, covering for the last 22 years this case of Crosley Green, who for 19 years was on death row. And if we had not started covering that case, I'm sure because it was in Florida, he would have been executed. And he was just released pending an appeal, but because there's no evidence anymore that it all connects him to the crime for which he was committed, uh, which he was convicted and sent to death row. And so that always should be behind in back of everyone's minds that not everyone is executed is actually guilty of the crime. And, and Aaron, you mentioned um, that he would have been executed and I can't help but think of my Twitter feed. Mar- Marty Tankliff wrote, you know, had the death penalty been in effect in New York at the time, because it was on and off and on and off at the time of uh, my parents' murders, I would have been executed. I could have been executed. And I think you responded like the heartbreaking um, or something to that effect. But it's true. Four percent. It's estimated four percent of people on death row are actually innocent. And God knows, many more than that don't necessarily deserve to be executed. Well, you certainly know that there are innocent people on death row because people have been exonerated on death row. And to think that we've exonerated exactly 100% of the innocent people is absurd. So you know that we the system missed people to begin with. They convicted innocent people. And you know that the exoneration process has missed those some of those same innocent people anyway. Right. In addition. And you're not even mentioning the ones who aren't quote-unquote exonerated, but get out, like we'll say the West Memphis Three, kind of forced to take an Alford plea, which I think is one of the worst, um, I don't even know what to call it. Processes Um, or procedures? Well, you want to call it that, but it's this ridiculous uh, procedure that allows somebody to be released, but it also lets the state off the hook for a wrongful conviction. It's ultimately plea extortion. Right, it is. It is. It is. Well, look, as an attorney who's counseled people uh, who've been offered that and counseled some to take it, uh, I have a theory about people in prison for life. Out is out. You want uh, eternal. You're right. etern- you want eternal justice. Um, perhaps after we we pass from this earth, you'll get it. But here, get out. If you can get out of prison, get out. And. I have to say, Aaron, it surprised me. It didn't surprise me when you said this. We spoke earlier, and I think you mentioned something. First of all, you've seen 12 men walk out of prison through exonerations or um, you know, having their convictions overturned. And I think you mentioned that you think it's the responsibility of journalists when it comes to criminal cases to be slightly bent towards the accused. Not really slightly, I think bent, um, before (laughs) someone is convicted. And I know people are surprised when I say that, but um, I think maybe it helps a bit that I also went to law school. And the whole idea, we give so much lip service to the idea that we view people innocent until they're proven guilty. But when you think about it, whose responsibility is it to make sure that the public sees the case that way? It's not yours as the defense attorney. I mean, certainly you want to, but you are advocates. And it's not the judge. 
certainly not the prosecutor. You know, the prosecutor is an advocate in and is supposedly only bringing charges against someone if he or she believes that he, he can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So that leaves us, the press. And we too often just kind of give up on our responsibility. It's so much easier just to quote the prosecutor, even if the prosecutor is wrong, even if the prosecutor is not exactly telling the facts, and we know the prosecutor is telling the facts to sound best for his case. Um, so it is our job all the time to put the prosecutor in the hot seat, um, to question the prosecutor's case first and foremost. Because that's the only way a person really gets that that presumption. And, and uh, speaking as someone who has been on the the other side of the questions, in other words, being questioned by you, which is not always entirely comfortable, uh, <laughs> I, I realize just how thorough uh, you do your job. Just how thorough the entire team at Forty Eight Hours uh, researches, investigates, digs into a case uh, before they present it on TV. How much work goes into that? And I and I have to ask you. I wonder about um, you how you grapple with the power of the media that you you have. And you know what I mean. You know that if you want to put your thumb on a scale, one side or the other, you can present a show that eighty percent of the people will think the person's guilty or not guilty, depending on how you present it. How do you how do you grapple with that? How do you deal with that kind of power? Well, I, I hope we never really put our thumb on the scale, or if we do, we do it toward innocence. Um, because, again, I think that is kind of our job, but I hope we wouldn't put our thumb at all, that we just try to convey this case as best we can. We often in our hours will include information that has been kept out of the court. Not all attorneys like when we do that. Um, recently I had to do that in a case of a, a young man who I do, do not think got a fair trial. He, um, has, he's on the autism spectrum and, uh, he was diagnosed when they still use the term with Asperger's and, um, but he never, you know, the cops were thrilled to have somebody who might not understand the questions who might be easily pressured. But we did know, and the jurors never heard some information that he did reveal. We had to. It was, I mean, it would be wrong if we had withheld it, information, incriminating information. But then we also reminded the audience, as we told this information, the jury did not hear at trial, that you can't necessarily believe it. He was pressured. He was, he, he often makes up stories. That's how he gets through his life, um, if he doesn't know the answer or if he wants to impress somebody, he just makes up stories. He's made them all his life. And so what is the greatest risk when you're being pressured by the cops? Making up something. You think you're going to get out of the room. Um, but I guess that was a long-winded way to say we try to do as much as we can really portraying the case as it is. Having said that, though, and let's talk about the Marty Tankle case. When I first started, if you went back and looked at our very first story with Marty Tankle, I think we would have been really questioning the case because Marty didn't seem emotional at trial. That bothered the jury. It did seem. Why did the killers let Marty live? Um, his sister, his half sister, um, had testified against him. So those were the things that we focus on the first. But then the more we spent time working on the case, then it became more and more, oh, my gosh, this this guy did not get a fair trial. And why wasn't his father's partner really questioned? Why did McCrary, uh, McCrary uh, you know, go get him and well, travel you say, with him? And, you say McCready. You, one of the things McCready, that came out of the sorry, – right. One of the things that came out of the interview with him – was him asserting that he was better uh, to you, if I recall correctly. He was better was at, at, at better at detecting falsehoods or lies than a poly polygraphist. That he was better yeah. off. He was a better 
polygraph. He was the human lie detector. Human lie detector. He didn't say it exactly. Robert that way. De Niro. Yeah, <laughs> but he said that, and we actually <laughs> exactly. used we actually used that. I used it when I deposed him later on for Marty's civil case, and obviously he looked foolish in making that assertion. But that came from your interview from him. Well, he wasn't the brightest bulb. <laughs> not, he was not the brightest bulb. He, he had but no hope with you. <laughs> no chance. And, and, and uh, I mean, poor Marty. When I now the stuff that we've learned about Foda, the DA, I just Marty should never have spent so much time in prison. I know. Seven, seventeen and a half years, and now he's uh, speaking of Spoda. <laughs> yeah, right. Seven. Yeah, he's he Spoda submitted his sentencing memorandum today. For people that don't keep up with local Suffolk politics, the district attorney in Suffolk County, who had been there for twelve years was himself indicted, uh, convicted of obstructing justice, witness tampering for his role in trying to protect the chief of police in Suffolk from uh, a charge of excessive force of beating a suspect. The government's asking for eight years, and his attorneys have asked for no jail, home incarceration, and community service. So, well, and what do you think he'll get? What do you think they'll decide? I, I think it's so wrong if he gets no jail time. It, you know, uh, it's tough because he's almost 80 and the judge is not going to want to give him a life sentence, right? So she's going to want to give him a sentence of incarceration, but not so long that he'll actually die in prison, which for him could only be a few years away, uh, unfortunately. I, I want to ask you about, you, you touched upon this, that you're gathering the evidence and interviewing the witnesses. And you mentioned at the beginning of the interview that one of the interviews you did for another case that we had that you covered, which is Cal Harris, the bodiless homicide out of uh, upstate New York. Man was convicted twice of uh, killing his wife, although never found a body. Eventually, he the cases were reversed. It was retried, and he was eventually acquitted. But there was an interview that you did, and not so much an interview, but you had a camera rolling in the lab of Henry Lee, the famous criminologist, with the prosecutors and the police, where they said some stuff that was quite damning to their case. And, and helpful to ours. Helpful to and our I case. I think helped ultimately uh, get him acquitted. How, how did you feel about us going after that information? And how did you feel about withholding it, knowing uh, how... I imagine you knew how damage it, damaging just, it would have been to their case well, had it come not out. Like a, not a matter that we weren't just holding it in this case. There is a principle here. And we are not supposed to be uh, working on either side. And so if we just hand it over things, then you, then you are putting your finger on the, on the scales. You really are. So we treat prosecutors and defense attorneys exactly the same. We weren't picking on you. We, our, our <laughs> principle is try not to. Now, we don't make promises to anybody that we will never hand over things. I think that anybody who allows us in knows that um, they hope in New York, because New York has a pretty good uh, reporter shield law, but clearly not good enough. Um, but but <laughs> do really, it was just uh, about right in that case. No, right, right, right. Um, but you notice I'm I'm not complaining. It, whatever the courts do ultimately decide, but we did our job. And I never quite, I mean, I, I think we should get a little bit more credit. We gave the state a very hard time because there were a lot of people they did not look into. They looked at Cal Harris. And no matter what, that troubled me. You know, look under every single rock and stone before you focus on the husband. Because, I mean, I, I guess there's an advantage of doing this as long as I have. So remember, uh, they always call him the dog catcher, but Dennis Rader in, in uh, Wichita, Kansas, better known as the BTK killer. And there was a man who had a shadow over his head for 30 years because they just assumed this man who had had lunch with his wife and left must have killed her because nobody could believe that a serial killer would go in the house. And he, his, his life and his reputation was ruined until they finally caught Dennis Rader. Uh, uh, and so that's a constant remain, a reminder that, yes, it's often the spouse or the lover 
who, especially in a violent type of uh, murder, yes, that's normal, but not always. No, right. and not exclusively him. Hey, and- before we break, I want you. I want to give you a chance to talk about your new podcast, My Life in Crime, which has got to be fascinating. If this last twenty minutes is any hint, what made you go into it, and how do you, how are you enjoying it? Well, I love it. I mean, just like why you all do this radio show. Um, I love it because. I can kind of reveal a little bit more of how I feel about the case. I'm still careful. I still submit <laughs> it to the CBS lawyers. But um, but I can give a little more uh, insight into the defendants, the prosecutor, why somebody's convicted. Hopefully, we're making people interested in the legal system, and not just as entertainment, but as something so important in their lives. And you started off as a lawyer, and... You know, most people that that follow you and watch you know that. But for those who don't, you uh, initially wanted to be a litigator. Am I right? Absolutely. But I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, um, and I'm older. And uh, that was a time when there weren't a lot of female lawyers. And um, I joined a law firm, and I wanted to be a rainmaker, the only way you could make money. And they were going to do a television program in my hometown. And I thought, well, that's a way to get my name out. Really stupid idea. But um, but I ended up loving doing stories about cases and lawyers and issues and quite inadvertently ended up in a whole new career. I, I, I hate to hear about uh, people not being able to follow their chosen career early on, but I, I dare say that you ended up exactly where you should have been. And bring a national awareness to future jurors everywhere, past, present, and moving yeah, forward. So you've done more good than many a single lawyer can do. Th- thanks. That is my goal, to be honest. Th- and, and, and you're still a crime hottie. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've seen true, you in true, person. True fact. True fact. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. We we really appreciate it. Uh, we'll talk to you again, and I I fear the next time you'll be asking us some questions. Yeah, I was going to say probably another case. <laughs> Thank you so oh, much. It would be an honor. Take care. Take care. Uh, Bye. Uh, that that wraps up this show. All too quickly. Uh, come see us next time. Memorial Day. We're going to provide a. A tribute to fallen soldiers, and we're going to have reti- uh, County Court Judge Terrence Murphy on, who is also a retired lieutenant colonel in the, in the Army. And he started was, Veterans Court and started Veterans in Court Nassau in Nassau County. County and use an Uber or a Lyft this weekend if you're going to have some beers. Or, or a taxi or your local. You know, don't give it all right. to Uber or Lyft. <laughs> The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of this station, JVC Broadcasting Management, or its sponsors. And or its sponsors. And or its sponsors. And or its sponsors. And or its sponsors.